get to the chapter that precedes chapter 12. We get to the great what faith chapter, great faith chapter. And that's because the writer of Hebrews now talks about those of the faith, and he starts way back in the early pages of the Old Testament, starts to talk about these great heroes of the faith. All of this goes together, but here's another thing about Paul to remember. Everything that he said before chapter 11 also applies. So as we get to these two verses, the entire book of Hebrews comes into play behind verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since, you got it? So here's the therefore. And, and I like um, my favorite section of chapter 11 is not starting just at verse 1. Verse 1 is important. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? Um, I like to start at verse 32. Because notice, this is one of those things where I think, well, that looks like Paul. Verse 32. What shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets. You know, he's running out of time. I've, I've, you know, I've spent 11 chapters talking to you guys. Um, let's try and wrap this up. I've got some place to go. And, you know, that's what he's doing. I don't have time. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quench the fury of the flames, and escape the edge of the sword. Just as a reminder, in those days, you didn't have to worry about church people packing um, pistols in the church. In those days... It was swords. Swords were cheap. They were easy to manufacture. There were plenty of swords, and plenty of people died by the sword. They even had different names for different types of swords. But notice the, you know, just already the sense of what's going on with these heroes of the faith. Um, they're suffering, and they're suffering big time for the faith. But this is just, we're just scratching the surface. So they quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemy armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were those who were tortured, refusing to be released so that there might, uh, they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging. And here we have a sense that maybe he's not just talking about Old Testament people. He makes it very evident in just a couple of verses that yes, he's referring to the hope they were looking forward to, but the jeers and flogging in the New Testament has only ever been used for Jesus. So for us, <coughs> Jesus suffered jeers and flogging. And even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Notice the gamut of what we're talking about here. They, they were poor. They were not just poor, they were also destitute. They suffered greatly. And if we think particularly about the New Testament martyrs, we think about the New Testament martyrs and James, for example, was filleted alive. They were boiled alive in oil. They were crucified. Peter asked to be crucified upside down. So he's talking about what people are willing to do for the faith of Jesus Christ. The world, <laughs> verse 38, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. You know, that, that early church was, and it did happen for folks in the Old Testament, 
I mean, it was tough being, if you wanted a tough job, just be a prophet for God among God's people who were uh, actually treated some of, some of the prophets worse uh, than the enemies of God. But if you think about the church, uh, the church endured a whole lot in those early days. For the first 300 years, we didn't even have a church building. You go into church buildings today, and it's not like ours. Uh, ours is one of the more modern. But you go into some of those older churches, and you've got the great vaulted ceilings with the great wood beams that go up. You know what that's reminiscent? It's on. It's purposeful. It's designed that way. And the reason it's designed that way is because in those early days, when the church went underground, and, and we think it's a... It's a crime for us to have to watch church on the internet during the pandemic. They lived decades, centuries, persecuted and underground, and they would crawl along the beach underneath the fishing boats and worship Jesus in the under, uh, underside, the upturned cavity of the boat. And so modern buildings have those ribs. And it's supposed to remind us, Hebrews chapter 11, people paid a big price in order for you to get here. I, I, I didn't say this first of us, but um, you know, the truth is, for every one of us, we exist in a little snapshot of time. If we're really honest, those who have preceded us paid for a lot of what we have. The buildings that we come to were at the sacrifice of the previous generation. Now, there, there, there's others who are doing things long before we even get on the scene. And that's what the writer of Hebrews was doing. But notice what he says, the world is not worthy of them. And, and I have to tell you from a leadership um, point of view, if you have pity parties when, when things get tough, if you have a pity party, um, you start to think maybe a little too much like Samuel. And remember Samuel, poor Samuel, here, here he is, he's frustrated because he's the last of the judges and the people are whining and complaining and they say, we want a king just like those guys over there. Give us a king. And so Samuel himself goes whining and complaining to God because the people weren't worth it. He's upset. And remember God's response to the poor old Sam? I hate it. It's just annoying as all get out. Sam. Sam. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. But I'm going to give them what they want. Remember, and all of that, and the whole king thing was not just, as Saul in particular was a lesson, but he was setting up for the deliverance for a real king that was coming, King Jesus. Talk about letting people live in stupid for a long time. Uh, what about letting people live in stupid for 1,200 years? Before the real, well, and we're getting to that. Actually, that's just an intro. Something, someone better this way comes. And so something better was coming. It is, it is Christianity. But it's also a someone, isn't it? So look at what the writer of Hebrews says in those last two verses of chapter 11. They were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what was promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. And that's when we get to Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And by the way, the sin so easily entangled I'll tell you where my sin is. Wally World. <laughs> I am so thankful. I 
praise God every day for coronavirus. That's an exaggeration. I don't. Because as soon as this hit, I had every reason not to go to Wally World because I would just get my phone out. I would put my order. Suzanne was in Texas, if you remember. And I'm putting my order in. And then I get to go drive to the parking lot and they bring it out to me. Because, because, you go to Wally World and you know those people? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Those people who stand four abreast across an aisle and think they're the only ones in the world and that Walmart was created for them. Right? Sin sets in my heart. I am not the Christian pastor that you've seen before you now. And there is a part of me that just, you know, it's like, who are you? So, yeah, it's kind of nice to be able to go and just, uh, you know, and, and it's funny because I kept having these moms who said, have you, you know, long before all this happened, they said, have you seen the new Walmart deal that you can order online and go and pick it up? I can go pick up my groceries in my pajamas. <laughs> people know that people already go to Walmart in their pajamas. Have you seen? I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so, but there, we have a struggle right now as we get to this verse, these verses. And here's the struggle. I, um, I'll, I'll share it with you. I, I just picked a few versions. So here is Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And just pay attention. I'm, I'm really only concentrating on about two words. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 in the English Standard Version. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Did you get that? There's those two words. The pioneer and perfecter of our faith in the NIV, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. See, your translators also struggle with those two words. Here's the New Living Translation, which is um, New Living. NIV is um, phrase by phrase. Um, and I'm going to throw a big word at you. New living is pericope by pericope. So it takes the whole passage, uh, puts it into an understanding for us, and then translates it. And, and there is another difference. Uh, it has to do with reading levels. The reading level for the new living is 6th grade. Reading level for NIV is 8th grade. New American Standard King James is high school or college. That's, that's the real, that's the big difference. So here's the New Living, and it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight which slows us down. I like that. That's a nice softening. I like that. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance. And so I switched the title from grit to endurance. The race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. See, they had problems there too. Not problems, but we're just trying to get the point across. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding his shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor of the sign of God's room. And now I'll share with you my favorite. Um, <laughs> this is... Uh, Decades ago, this is what I memorized. So therefore, it's what I'm comfortable with. And I am one of those snobs who will tell you that the New American Standard is the best, still this day, the best word for word translation in the Greek New Testament. Still. But notice what it does, and you'll see why I like it. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance, 
and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Notice how similar they all are in those regards. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. <clears throat> Do you catch what the issue is? And, and, and just to give you, unless you feel my pain, here it is. <laughs> this is it in Greek. Well, thank you. It's much more clear now. <laughs> Actually, and, and, and I did point this out um, first service. You, you're getting pretty much the same sermon. I, you know, you, they get when I was doing four services in Florida. You, you find out that fourth sermon is really good. Yeah. But <laughs> if this was in English letters instead of Greek letters, you would act, you would recognize some of those. Uh, on the fourth line down, third letter, third word in, that's that's agony. Uh, it sounds kind of familiar if you think about it, agony. He he rejected the agony of the cross or spurned the agony of the cross, the shame. But 